Sir. So I have these three topics to cover. ELP, I will cover and manufacturing tolerances. So before I start, we should thank the, all the great uh, ophthalmologists who helped us with the power calculation. With a special thanks to Dr. Wolfgang Hages, one of the non ophthalmologists in this group who passed away last year, who has done pioneering work, and every one of them has helped millions of, of our patients in all parts of the world. It is variously termed as estimated lens position or the effective lens position. It's a term used to denote the position of the lens in the eye, and it's a distance between the principal plane of the intraocular lens and the cornea. In a standardized pseudophagic schematic eye, it is, it is uh, defined as being 5.25 millimeters behind the corneal vertex plane. And the lens position should be fairly easy to measure because we can easily measure the corneal thickness with current instruments. We can easily measure the anterior chamber depth with great accuracy with current instruments. But how do we guess the position of a le intraocular lens that is one millimeter thick within a four or a 4.5 millimeter capsular bag? We can easily measure the actual lens accurately, but the holy grail of final position of the intraocular lens, the ELP. Over the years, many different variables have been used to calculate the lens. In 2008, Norby showed us that there are three major reasons for errors in IOL power calculations. One third of the errors are a result of axial length and corneal K reading measurements. A third of the error was because of errors in estimating the ELP. And the final third is errors due to mistakes that we make in post-operative refraction. It's interesting to note that both axial length measurement and K reading can contribute to ELP errors. Last year, Vulcan Hages remarked that axial length measurements have reached a very high level of accuracy. And today we can, we can actually measure the variations in the axial length in different parts of the day it's unlikely that this measurements can become more accurate in a meaningful way. For any given position of a lens in the eye, the actual power depends on the lens diopter, the lens thickness, the shape factor of the lens, whether it is a meniscus lens, a planar convex lens, a biconvex lens, and finally and most importantly, the corneal power. We know that the corneal power is an approximation here is just my posterior corneal measurement in three millimeter, five millimeter, and seven millimeter uh, 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 rings. And you can see the wide variation in both magnitude and axis of in any given eye. All those are not dependent on us, but we have three major surgically induced factors which will affect surgeon induced dependent factors that will affect ELP. And the most important of these is the rexis overlap. We should aim for a 0.5 to 0.7 millimeter, 360 degree overlap of our intraocular lenses. Severe capsular phimosis like this can alter ELP, as can a large rexis like this. This can permit the intraocular optic of this three piece lens to move out of the bag, move forward, and change the ELP. The second factor, which is in the surgeon's hand, is your choice whether you choose to put a three piece lens or a single piece lens. A three-piece lens has got haptics that's angulated anteriorly in the post-op period as the capsule shrink wraps and, and it compresses the haptics, the optic can move forward in three-piece lenses. With a planar single-piece lens, this problem does not exist. And again, if you choose to put an intraocular lens with an anterior offset as against a planar design, your, very, your results can vary. Now, let us see what happens when I move this plus 20 day of the lens in a lensometer by about two centimeters. So what happens is the power of the lens of this 20 D lens can vary from 20 to 24.75 diopters. Similarly, inside the eye, when our intraocular lens moves inside the eye, Olsen taught us in 2007 that minor variations can cause changes. Look at this 0.25 millimeter and a movement of a lens inside the eye. This is half the thickness of the cornea. If the intraocular lens moves 
0.25 millimeters in an average eye of around 22 uh, from 22 mm in length, we can get a post-op error of up to 0.4 diopters. In a myopic eye, the same movement will cause much less of a difference. While in a hyperopic eye, in a small eye with a, with a 20 millimeter axial length, the difference can be as high as 0.5 to 0.6 diopter for a small 250 micron anterior shift of the intraocular lens. The lens material and the haptic design can also affect the effective lens position. This interesting article by Laura Raymond et al. showed how the intraocular lens optic can move forward when the haptics are compressed by as little as one millimeter by capsular fibrosis. In this set, you can see that there are uh, C-shaped loop lenses on the left and plate haptic lenses on the right. And this is very easy to see. When you have a one millimeter compression, there is no or very, very minimal change in ELP when you have a C-loop intraocular lens while the same one millimeter compression of the haptics can cause quite dramatic one millimeter or more anterior displacement of the optic if you choose to use a plate haptic intraocular lens. So plate haptic intraocular lenses have to be made very rigid to resist these kind of movements. In summary, a 0.25 millimeter change in ELP can lead to a 0.3 to 0.5 diopter in error in normal and short eyes. We have reached the engineering limits of measuring the axial length, and we must find a better way to measure corneal power. There are physiological variations in anatomy and in healing that contribute to ELP error, and some of this cannot be taken care of by better quality instruments. My next topic is on IOL power tolerances. It's interesting that all our lenses are made as per ISO standards, which were defined in, in 1999. And what do these standards say? For the usual lens that we use with a power between 15 and 25 diopters, they permit a 0.4 diopter of error and they, and they pass them. This is the actual FDA approval for a multifocal lens, which was approved in 2014. This particular lens is widely being used in various parts of the world. And here we can see the optical requirements and the FDA has passed it. And here we can see that they have used the same criteria, 15 to 25 diopter. They have tested to see whether the spherical equivalent of this multifocal lens was within 0.4 diopter, and they have passed this lot of lenses. We are using these kind of lenses. The ANSI standards for toric lenses are very similar. They specify that the eyeboid spherical and cylindrical combined error should be within 0.3 to 0.5 diopter. Also, that the axis should be marked within five degrees of the actual orthogonal cylinder of that intraocular lens. And the rotational stability should be within five degrees for 90% of the intraocular lens over a three month period. Several companies that offer intraocular lenses in India were asked about their manufacturing tolerances. None of them are willing to share the data for this presentation. I think this information is quite inform important to us and I request AIOS to formally request this data. What is the uh, tolerance that they apply? Is it as per ISO standard or do they have tighter tolerances in the lens of which they supply to us? So what is the true power of a lens when it is marked plus 20D? In 1996, Servaka Nopi et al. Uh, uh, determined the power differences when the, uh, a lot of lenses were, were measured in different labs. And they found that less than 1% of the dioptric power was the average difference in between various labs. What this means is, what this means is, the same lens can be measured at different labs and they can give a error, which can be up to 0.2 diopter for a 20 diopter lens. Kenneth Hoffer used the US FDA optical testing lab using a more advanced confocal laser method to find out what, we, what is the variation of exact power labeled intraocular lenses. And he found something very similar. When, he, when a company marked the power, exact power on those lenses, this was a company which supplied lenses from Europe, and he found that the error was 0.18 with a standard deviation of 0.12. So though they were marked with the exact power, 
the actual power could vary by 0.2 or 0.3 diopters from what is stated on, on the label. He also found that in these hydrophilic lenses, when the temperature was raised from 22 to 23 degrees, the actual power increased by 0.13 diopter. So there seems to be a wide variation between different labs and, and what is in the lens and what is marked on the box. And I'm sure more work can be done on this. The last part of my topic is on IOL power steps. We all are aware that we get the power steps in 0.5 diopters in the, the usual ranges. And in extreme powers, they're there, they're available in steps of one diopter. Toric lenses are usually available between 1.5 and 6 diopter in 0.75 steps. A small group of vocal surgeons believe that we should get intraocular lenses in 0.25 steps, and this will make our results more accurate. Dr. Warren Hill strongly feels with the current technology, it's not needed because the actual power of a 0.5 diopter lens inside the eye. The lens power, the effective power is only 0.37 diopter, the spectacle plane. If you implant the lens with a 0.25 diopter step, the effective power in the spectacle plane will be a 0.17 diopter, and we do not refract in 0.17 steps. So this will not be of much to use to us. In 2005, Technomed, a German company, started using the exact labeling method, and, and we know that LensTech HD is also supplying hydrophilic lenses and they claim to have a manufacturing tolerance of 0.1D. When these lenses were implanted, various surgeons have shared their data and they show that up to 84% of their post-ops will be within 0.5 diopter. And for the lens, lens test and soft tech HD lens, Hunter not, uh, Newsom presented that 70% of his uh, post-ops are within 0.5 diopter. As most of us are able to achieve these levels with our regular lenses, the need for a 0.25 step has not, has not really picked up. So power calculation is a multi-step process. The weakest link currently is not measurement of the corneal thickness, the anterior chamber depth, the lens thickness, or the axial length. We are able to get very accurate uh, uh, measurements of these. The weakest step is estimating the ELP as well as measuring the true corneal power in the visual axis and not on the corneal vertex. So I think these have to be taken care of before we uh, start using lenses in 0.25 power steps. So in brief, I have covered the ELP power steps and I will manufacture tolerances. And if you have any questions, I'll be, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you.